Okay, uh, so uh, we started last time uh, the discussion of how gravity couples to a CFT. And uh, the basic point uh, was that uh, there is a slight paradox there. Uh, namely, we looked at uh, the scalar field coupled to gravity. And we saw that uh, this action actually in the conformal gauge, if you take G alpha beta e to the phi delta alpha beta, uh, which is always an accessible gauge, uh, then um, phi disappears from this d to psi. And this is the action. Uh, so the impression is that uh, gravity doesn't influence conformal field theory, but that's a wrong impression. Uh, namely, we started uh, well, looking at a different gauge in which the interval can be written down in this form. Uh, and the change of the action was basically simply uh, the H plus plus term multiplied by the energy momentum tensor. Uh, I mean for the small uh, values of uh, H plus plus. Mm. And uh, in the second order, we can, we got uh, the expression that we have the action, which is which is h plus plus t minus minus h plus uh, t minus minus. Excuse me, uh, t minus minus t minus minus h plus plus, uh, which basically corresponds in in the in terms of final diagram. Uh, it corresponds to gravitational heat, to to vacuum polarization. By, of the gravitational field. You have the matter created and annihilated, and you have two H, and this coupling, this is uh, basically the correlation function of two energy momentum tensor. Um, um, then uh, it's clearly non-zero because uh, of positivity of norms, and this is a um, this is a positive thing, t minus minus. And moreover, we actually know what it is. I'm just repeating in a slightly different language uh, what we uh, summarizing what we discussed last time is uh, one or x minus to the fourth. Um, which in the Fourier components is uh, Q minus cube divided by Q plus. In the Fourier representation. Um, uh, multiplied, what is important, the a number of coefficients are not important. What is important is that it's proportional to the central charge uh, of uh, the Rasora algebra. And that's basically the expression you get uh, in, in any, uh, although we started with this, uh, um, uh, with a uh, uh, particular example of the scalar field, but uh, it's, it's quite general. You have, uh, when you have conformal field theory, you have holomorphic uh, energy momentum tensor. Its correlation function is dictated by its dimension. It has dimension 2 and spin 2, um, 2 minuses here, as you see. And by more or less by definition, the central charge is a 
is the uh, proportionality of the coefficient. Um, it essentially counts um, it counts the number of uh, states in the theory uh, simply because if you have, for example, a free part free particles, then if you have several free particles, you will have uh, the central charge uh, equal to the number of uh, different particles. Um, so, uh, uh, by, by the way, uh, as a home exercise, establish the connection between the central charge, as we defined it a few lectures ago, uh, and the stefan boltzmann constant. Uh, for two-dimensional mass system. Okay, um, so this is it. This expression is, of course, true. There are terms uh, of h to the cube, etc. Corresponding, in principle, there are plenty of terms like that. Mm -hmm. Uh, another exercise, by the way, uh, is calculate this diagram for the uh, free field. So take the propagator for this field, for this field, the vertex for the uh, coupling of gravity, and uh, confirm that the answer has this form. Uh, okay. Um, but it's so far it's very uh, it's very limited what we're doing because we just it's not an exact formula we just expand it in H and uh, but what is important that gives you basically the method to um, include vacuum polarization into the into your equations of motion uh, namely um, namely we can calculate now the correlation function of h plus plus h plus plus since the h plus plus a plus h plus plus are gaussian um, the correla the correlation function is just the inverse of uh, of, of this uh, t minus minus t minus minus and so we get uh, the result that is proportional to 1 over c um, uh, multiplied um, uh, multiplied uh, by uh, q plus divided by q minus to the cube. Um, uh, and um, act actually um, this this would be a, this will be the ex correct formula when c is large enough for c small we there are corrections to this but we uh, just want to orient ourselves first and then uh, do the exact calculation um, so let's now imagine that we have another useful uh, example is the Lagrangian of free fermions so that's, which is uh, the Lagrangian of free fermions is, uh, is this. Uh, the interaction Lagrangian with the gravitational field uh, is uh, what? what? What is, suppose you now couple to the weak gravitational field h plus plus in the gauge in this gauge so only this component of the metric tensor is non-zero is non-trivial uh, what the advantage of this gauge we will see it it has uh, both advantages and disadvantages in comparison with the, with, with the conformal gauge but that we will see later uh, at the moment i want you to tell me how to couple uh, H plus plus to, to the fermions. Any thoughts about that? Mm -hmm. huh? 
through derivative? Uh, which derivative? Well, uh, you have to basically say that in the leading order it's t minus minus, and t minus minus for free fermion is just psi minus d minus psi minus. The reason for this formula is very simple. Uh, it's the only combination. Well, you of course can couple it uh, in a. There are. There is a general prescription how to couple fermions to gravitational field in any dimensions, but here it's much everything is much much simpler, um, and you simply need to construct some bilinear uh, which has the right spin. Uh, the spin of fermion is one half, so this minus it actually means that under Lorentz rotation you get the factor one half in front of the angle. This is a vector, so this is a spinner, this is a vector, this is a spinner again, so the total spin is two as it should be. That's why it has this form. Um, and, so, but, uh, and so we get interaction Lagrangian, uh, which is proportional to, there are a lot of pi's and uh, uh, some small numbers, etc., but that's irrelevant. Um, it's just h plus plus psi minus d minus psi minus, and uh, there is a. Uh, uh, that's what we need at the moment, but there is an interesting fact about uh, coupling to gravity in two dimensions, and this fact will make uh, another exercise. The exact formula, this formula we derived and it is in, by the derivation assumes that it is approximate. Uh, but in fact it's much, the formula is exact. It's much better than uh, um, the coupling of the fermions uh, to gravitational field, the most, the general formula for arbitrary gauge is just this. So you have this long, the, the, in electromagnetism we would have H plus plus and H minus minus are components of the, you know, of the metric. And this, uh, this uh, exercise of the, may require you some work because you have to first learn how you write down the Dirac equation in, many, in any dimension with uh, what is called field binds and then reduce it in two dimension to this. It requires some, some computations. Uh, but uh, actually you can also take another path and say that uh, uh, this for if you guess this formula, it has all the right symmetries. Um, it is so that's also an acceptable way to so, to um, to solve this problem. Uh, but as I saw so this, this is just h plus plus multiplied by t minus minus. In this, in our gauge, h minus minus is zero, so these plus fermions don't participate. Um, now. And now the crucial point for which uh, I'm doing all this. Let's calculate the correction to the green function. This, this was the Ising model, fermions, for example. Majorana fermions, uh, one, one species, and, and that's it. Um, now we couple it, coupled it to gravity. What happened? Uh, as you see, by the way, the gauge invariance in, is, uh, the, or diffeomorphism invariance is related to the conservation of t minus minus. Um, yeah, um, what we will be uh, trying to discuss is how 
how anomalous dimensions of these fermions. They are drastically modified by gravity, and uh, that we will be discussing in a moment. Uh, let me, before we come to this question, I, I left unfinished this important point, uh, that uh, the important point, which I didn't clarify enough last time, was that uh, in the conformal gauge we don't see we don't see the uh, interaction with gravity. It it looks as if it is absent because when we uh, do this, so what what is the resolution of this thing? Uh, the resolution of this thing is that um, we have to. When we calculate the functional integral, uh, this is a uh, logarithm of uh, that is the, this loop which we discussed. Uh, and let's take a, 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 a brief uh, look at this loop. Uh, so let's let's look at this thing. Uh, I, I gave you already the home exercise to calculate it for the plus plus for the components uh, t minus minus t minus minus, and that that's that's you will do. You will find well uh, converged integrals and so on. But now let's look at the component phi generally couples to the component component t plus minus. Uh, by the way, what is the t plus minus in terms in general terms uh, in terms of uh, free field? Uh, or uh, what I'm asking is, you have t mu nu. What is t plus minus uh, when you in if you, well, it it is special case of t mu in two dimensions? What is it? T uh, plus plus. T plus plus. It's it's certain combination. T one plus. Uh, yes. Plus t two two right. Minus two I t two. No, no. That's uh, uh, th this is indeed uh, as you said is. is T11 minus T22 plus 2i T12. But t, and this is T++. What is T plus minus in these components? It's trace. It's trace, exactly. And the reason why we see no interaction uh, is that the, the trace formally is zero. Uh, so we don't see any interaction, but... Huh? So you're taking the conformal anomaly? Yeah, well, you will see that, in fact, uh, what I want to show you is where the, intera the interaction is nevertheless there, because we notice that it exists unambiguously in this gauge, you see? In this gauge it's there, so we must understand, uh, we have some puzzle which we must resolve. There is no doubt that the interaction is present because, uh, because of this calculation. The cal this calculation is completely unambiguous. Um, but let's see what happens if we take two traces. Uh, if we try to calculate um, the um, t plus minus t plus minus. And I will probably tell you what, uh, what, what, what happens then. Um, you have to, the problem is that this diagram will be quadratically divergent. Um, well, well, there are two ways. Let me briefly indicate the, the way out of, the, of this puzzle. The way number one, Let's imagine that uh, particle the, this the, the, that we are dealing with a Lagrange 
uh, with a free field plus and we add a small mass to it. And then t plus minus is uh, proportional to the mass square of i square. Uh, it is non-zero, but it becomes zero as m goes to zero classically. The point is that we c then we will that when we calculate the correlation function of phi square, they become uh, singular in one over m, and this mass in the numerator cancels the mass in the denominator. That's one way out the way out of the paradox, and the result is finite. The other way is to notice that in the Euclidean we, we, we must introduce the, um, uh, the, the heavy field in all is uh, what is called Pauli Villars. Mm, and in this case we need to uh, introduce heavy w w the Pauli Villars prescription is is this it it was designed in quantum electrodynamics it is just to say that you, you take a loop you have a loop it is divergent but let's subtract from it a similar loop of of the regulators and take the mass of these regulators to infinity Again, it's very easy to see that there is the remnant of these Pauli Villers uh, regulators will give us non zero result. It will give us phi dependence. Um, it's probably worth a, a few comments uh, more than I said. Um, we, we, First of all, what does it mean in QED, for example, that we subtract this thing? It means that we're saying that uh, the theory, say quantum electrodynamics, is well defined that when p square uh, momenta are of the order of electron mass. Uh, but when, but the uh, integrals virtual particles which we create, they tend to have momentum much higher. Uh, the integrals diverge, and uh, which means physically that we are creating higher and higher energy. So we assume that um, the theory is somehow uh, defined in the ult uh, in some specific ways, defined in the ultraviolet. And you have ma several ways of defining it. Uh, however, the answer is uh, for the low energy is universal. Uh, this is because uh, gauge invariance uh, fixes all possible dependencies uh, in this case. Uh, so um, that's just one of the way to regulate to cut off the integrals. As I mentioned to you already, uh, if you simply cut off the integrals by k smaller than lambda, you, you, you can try this naive way of doing this. It doesn't work because it breaks uh, gauge invariance and it generates the photon mass of the order of lambda square, which is unacceptable. Um, and as I said, qualitatively you need to, uh, you need to have a field dependent cutoff. Uh, and Pauli Villers regulators is, in a sense, uh, uh, this, they provide this. Uh, so you basically say we have, in QED, we have the uh, d mu plus i a mu psi. Let's add, as Pauli and Villers did, chi d mu plus i a mu chi plus m chi bar chi and send m to infinity. If the theory were convergent, then 
the limit m to infinity would just uh, give you zero. It will not. Uh, that would mean that if you have certain fixed energies at which uh, particles uh, are created, then um, th th there is no contribution from the infinite masses. But in fact, there is, and this contribution uh, generates uh, the term. You mean uh, particle chi will be created with energies above mass, right? So what? Say again. So particles, chi particles, yes. will be created only after energy. No, no, chi, you integrate over all energies. Yeah, uh, uh, physically it means. Uh, it means physically that uh, at, uh, we have a well-defined theory at low energies, but when you go to the energies of the order of uh, chi particles, or m, uh, theory is modified. Uh, and the only thing, we, we don't know how it's modified, uh, but we know just that these modifications should not break gauge invariance. Uh, and so you simply, um, uh, uh, simply do this. It's uh, actually, uh, maybe, uh, it's, it simply means it's a Gaussian integral, so you have the to define the determinant, the infinite determinant, I nabla will be the long derivative, so we have gamma mu plus m. Um, but this, what, what is this? The logarithm of the determinant is uh, the sum of the eigenvalues, right? If you have this, if you have this uh, operator, you take uh, is it clear where the determinant comes from? It's uh, when you integrate quadratic expression, the integral becomes uh, the determinant. Uh, and since lambda n becomes larger and larger, there is no bound on lambda n. It's clear that this thing diverges. Now, when we look at this thing, uh, we have a difference of the determinant. So with Pauli the Lars, uh, this is divergent because lambda grows. With Pauli Villars, uh, we have sum over n log n log lambda n divided by lambda n plus m. Uh, and this time, you see that when uh, lambda goes to infinity, in fact, logarithm goes to zero. And you can always uh, make things find the, the regulators in such a way that it is, it is convergent. So it regulates the theory. Why do you have subtraction of the not uh, multiplication? Oh, because uh, it is assumed, oh, by not multiplication, because it's logarithm of the determinant. It's not the... No, no, I mean, what are, is it, you wrote action, right? Ye yes, uh, but I assume that chi have different loops ah. with chi are designed so as to have uh, wrong spin statistics mm -hmm. so that they uh, actually compensate. Yeah. Uh, and that's why we have this ratio of uh, lovely. Mm, but this, uh, and, but there are of course millions of other ways to regulate the theory. I'm digressing a little bit from our team, but it's important, and maybe I will. Uh, uh, maybe it's worth this few minutes. So, you, for example, you can look at the theory on a lattice, which is also gauge invariant. Uh, you can do many other things. You can add some higher derivatives and so on, without breaking, without breaking this uh, gauge invariance condition. Mm. Well, the, the impression is that we get something very uh, messy uh, and uh, not, so, not something unique. Um, but that's a wrong impression. In fact, we do have... Uh, uh, we, uh, I actually will explain it in QED first since I assume you know QED quite well, it's familiar grounds. Uh, 
in QED, uh, we calculate polarization operator. And if we just blindly calculate it, let me show you, it's all simple. Uh, we have trace, gamma mu, if this is p, this is p plus q, we get 1 over p plus m, gamma nu, 1 over p plus q plus m. And uh, that's the answer. Now, and we integrate our d4p. You see immediately that uh, this thing um, actually diverges like a second like a second power, because you have p to the fourth here and p squared in denominator. So it's quadratically divergent. But now let me make the following trick. Suppose I'm into this is p menu of q. It contains, since it's Lorentz Lorenz invariance, it must have the structure r delta menu plus b q mu q nu. A and B could be uh, whatever, it's, they are functions of Q square, they can be divergent and so on. So what we notice is that general P menu is divergent. Uh, but uh, look at this term. When you pick up this term, mm, this term will be convergent, actually, or at least logarithmically divergent. Uh, why, why, why you, this term uh, would be better than this one, would behave much better than this one? Look at this integral and figure out. It's always good to have some qualitative understanding before you start computing. It's not a big deal to compute it, to calculate it explicitly, but uh, it's better to have... Um, Understanding first, yeah, because the, uh, the power of the denominator will be uh, higher. The the, the, you are right. Uh, you have to expand in Q. When you start expanding in Q, uh, you have to expand up to the second term, up to the second power. As a result, um, you will have so you will have something one over p plus Q divided by p plus Q square divided symbolically by p square, um, and uh, uh, you also multiply it by, uh, by 1 over p from here, and that will give you linear, uh, that would give you linear divergence, but linear divergence cancels. Uh, linear divergence uh, is uh, when you cut off the integral isotropically, it, it, is, it always cancels. Uh, so uh, this, this B term will be known and it will be a concrete function of Q square, an ambiguous function of Q square. So we will have the following structure. We will have pi mu nu, uh, some undetermined and quadratically divergent constant, plus I will use the uh, lowercase letters b of q square, which is well defined, q mu q nu. Um, oh, actually I made a mistake here. Oh, right. Oh, why did you stop me from making mistakes? <laughs> <laughs> it's p, p to the cube, right? Mm -hmm. And now it's very... I, I, I felt something is wrong when uh, I, I was telling this. Uh, and indeed you get uh, d4p divided by p to the fourth, which is logarithmic integral, and that's how it should be. So b of q square is indeed logarithm of lambda square divided by q square. Logarithm are fine. Of this, 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 there is no ambiguity. The whole function is well defined. Uh, it's just uh, when you do renormalization, you absorb lambda, you replace lambda by the mass. So everything is fine with this term. It's well convergent. This term is completely crazy. 
not only it uh, is divergent, its value depends on how you cut off the integral. So if you regulate in a different way, you get different A and so on. So how we get out of this puzzle? Try to demand the conservation of current. Yes, actually the conservation of current. We, we, we will say this. We don't know uh, what happens at these high energies, but we know that current is, or we assume with good reason that the current is conserved. And that means that A is equal to minus in any regularization which preserves current conservation, A is equal to minus B. So the, the whole thing is completely unambiguous. Um, and a very similar thing happens in the conformal gauge here. Mm, you will have, uh, in the general gauge, so that's some lesson to be remembered, that uh, some divergences uh, can be reduced drastically by the by 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 the gauge by symmetries which you have which you have in the problem. Um, okay, and uh, now the last thing before we go further uh, about uh, what is called tr trace anomaly that the trace of energy momentum tensor will not be zero, as as we saw last time. We have the polarization operator. Which is, del which is Q square, delta mu nu perpendicular, delta lambda gamma perpendicular. This uh, polarization operator, that's what we derived. In the gauge, and that now it's, it's a direct consequence of the, uh, of the diffeomorphism symmetry, of the gauge symmetry in the problem just like it was in QED. Uh, now, uh, we check this, uh, and it's actually proportional to the uh, central charge. We check this uh, in the light cone gauge. In the light cone gauge, uh, it, it reduces precisely to this reduce precisely to this. Uh, so, uh, and on the other hand, it was nothing but t mu nu, t lambda gamma. And now let's uh, couple it to the gravitation, to, let's go to the conformal gauge. In the conformal gauge, the gravitational field h mu nu is simply phi delta mu nu. So we will get the trace of this, trace of this, but th this result shows that there is th the answer is non zero, namely the Lagrange, the effective action W, which you get in the conformal gauge, will be C um, Q square phi Q phi minus Q phi of Q phi of minus Q into the lower dQ. And uh, this expression is also completely unambiguous because, uh, because it must coincide. We must get, we impose the results which we use in the light cone gauge uh, that defines pi and uh, that's, that defines the answer in the conformal gauge. Now, what's interesting is that, uh, this, so this answer is local in space time. It is local. Mm. Uh, so, uh, and while, by the way, uh, in the light cone gauge, the answer is non local. Uh, by the way, what, what do I mean uh, saying that in the light cone gauge the answer is non local? What does mean non locality in terms of Qs and so on? Yeah, you see there's a singularity here. Um, 
it scales like q square, but uh, there is a q plus singularity. Uh, it is clear that we couldn't have in the conformal gauge, uh, we could have anything singular at all. What does that mean, this locality means? Uh, that phi, about what it tells us about the origin of this phi dependence, where it comes from. How it happened that uh, uh, that uh, our expression turns out to be to have non-zero trace uh, while we started with zero trace. Well, um, let me... Uh, the expression here interacts with the trace of, if you take conformal gauge, it's non-zero. Okay? So, uh, somehow, uh, some We, we, we cannot, it's inconsistent to set uh, t plus minus to zero, what we show. Um, but uh, what is uh, important here is that the answer in terms of this phi in the conformal gauge must be, uh, must be completely local. Why, why is that? What, what, what I claim is that all this logic is fine, there are no paradoxes that gives a unique answer for the induced action, W. Uh, and uh, uh, it is because the, we have local, um, but we must have local effective action in the conformal gauge. That's the only possible answer which uh, avoids contradictions. So why is that? Why any non-locality in phi uh, would be a disaster? For that you need to uh, kind of remember again how, how this phi appeared, this story about power dealers and so on. Well, uh, yes. Uh, yeah, but I expanded. Uh, I'm, I'm, we are considering weak fields all the time, and as a matter of fact, we will, in a moment after we clarify this question, we will go to arbitrary field because this expression, in terms, in fact, works for arbitrary fields. How is phi exactly defined? Why? Oh, okay. Uh, G menu. G menu is e to, that's exact formula. It's approximately equal to delta menu plus phi delta menu. And that's I called H menu. So that's the, precisely what I mean. And it's with this H menu, general, so we generally decompose G menu as delta menu plus H menu. Uh, and uh, when we use the light cone, um, we get we, we get uh, the expression for this operator, and then we pass to the conformal gauge. And it's it's a, so, a little bit confusing, but uh, in this simple example, you can uh, follow. You can actually clarify this. Um, so, yes? It should depend on, the, I mean, what we did is some gauge fixing. And it, yes. This is uh, not non-trivial in quantum field theory usually. So it's a general answer, of course. But it's what? I mean, it's not like pre a precise answer, but there should be some gauge fixing term in the, if we want to do Oh, but we are not at this stage yet. Uh, we are simply, 
calculating the reaction uh, with resp uh, of uh, what happens to the partition function of the matter fields when you couple it to gravity. It's another matter than we, have, we will next integrate over gravity and things like that, gauge fixing. But we are not doing this. We are doing very simple and straightforward thing. It's like in quantum electrodynamics, we integrate out uh, fermions and we get effective action which involves polarization, vacuum polarization by these fermions. Uh, as we discussed last time, we have dielectric constant of the vacuum, which is, becomes non-trivial. Uh, but that uh, all happens at the early stage when things are simple. Then we have to fix the gauge and introduce the ghosts and uh, do gravity. Uh, but it's not what we are doing here. Mm. Um, so, uh, so the point which I was trying to make is that this dependence of phi, which was absent here, it certainly was not absent when if you add Pauli Villers re regulators to this. So, uh, when we add chi d beta chi plus m square chi square and we then want to tend mass to infinity. Uh, this, uh, while if you substitute uh, the conformal gauge, you will get d alpha chi square plus m square. Here the dependence on phi will appear full, full uh, in full uh, m square e to the phi chi square. So you see that um, you get explicit dependence on phi. And now the question is whether uh, it will remain there as mass goes to infinity or not. And this argument tells us you can actually do these integrals. Um, you can try for the, we, that's another exercise, but which we don't have time for. Now is to do the to calculate this contribution of pauli villers loop explicitly and see that uh, indeed you will get uh, the, 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 this answer. Uh, but what I wanted to stress is that this answer is completely unambiguous because it follows from gauge invariance. We calculate it, we have gauge invariant expression for polarization, we then we go, went to the gauge, to a particular gauge, and in order to calculate it, we calculated it, and then we changed the gauge back, back to uh, conformal uh, gauge, and we get the, uh, we, we uh, get the answer. So, so you get, so, so what, what, is, what was the problem? So if we just work okay. this gauge, you don't have uh, the five to the, we so don't you're asking why we do, why? Yeah, yeah. Well, the, the puzzle was when we take naive classical action like that, mm -hmm. uh, then uh, we don't have uh, the dependence on this phi field so at all. Scale invariant, right? Because, yeah, yeah. Well, it's just yeah. e to the phi here, e to the minus phi here, and, uh, and nothing comes, no, nothing, nothing remains. Uh, at the same time, uh, the, and classically that's true. If you have, actually if you want to uh, solve some classical equations like that, indeed they will be conformally invariant and in two dimensions and um, uh, it all will be true. But now when we calculate quantum loops, when we calculate quantum loops, uh, we have to introduce regulators. Another way to introduce regulators, by the way, is to use some higher derivatives here. If you add the term with higher derivatives, it, it will, uh, it's only the term with lowest number of derivatives which does not contain phi. Mm, otherwise, it's, it contains phi. And this phi dependence from the 
so it comes from the ultraviolet region. Yes, yeah, so it, mean, it means that the ultraviolet region is not scale invariant. It's yes, it is not. Oh, of course, it is not. It's yes. Scale invariant. Yeah, 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 yeah. Definitely, definitely. We uh, we can we are forced to do this because we any regularization will break scale invariance. The question is then whether it will have some effects on the low energy world. You see, okay. it's. Uh, it's like a, well, uh, uh, basically, I already said this. So that's uh, uh, some. Uh, why, why do you always break experience like that? Uh, well, because you see, if you, uh, how you can regulate Feynman diagrams in this, uh, say, in, in QED or something. You, you want to have, uh, say, uh, you have bosonic propagator p square minus m square, or in Euclidean p square plus m square, and suppose theory is divergent. Uh, one way, more or less arbitrary, to regulate it is to add p to the fourth. That's, by the way, how Feynman did it originally. And uh, to say that, uh, we return to our theory when lambda goes to infinity. But then we have to first calculate all integrals and then send lambda to infinity. Um, and that's, that's equivalent to adding higher derivatives to the Lagrangian, right? That's clear. So you have higher derivatives in Lagrangian. Now, now what I'm saying is that if you have a scalar field and you add any higher derivative to the Lagrangian, it will not be scale invariant anymore. It's only the lowest term which is scale invariant. It's impossible to regulate it in such a way that you preserve scale invariance. Mm -hmm. So that's uh, how things are. Uh, it's actually kind of interesting because you see, and I want you to work through this because it's not that the calculations are difficult or something. Calculations are trivial. But the logic is a bit uh, non-trivial. It contains some. And this logic actually very much worth knowing because you encounter similar problems in, in many, in many non-trivial cases. Um, OK. You know for sure that the low energy physics is universal? That the low energy physics what? Is universal. Oh, OK. Uh, uh, let me repeat the logic. Uh, because I found the gauge in which I have no divergences in this light cone gauge, it's remarkable because the polarization operator in this gauge is convergent. Very much like this term is convergent in polarization operator. Uh, so I, I find um, the, the gauge in which everything is convergent, then I don't need Pauli-Villars. I can write down these regulators, of course, even there, but their contribution will tend to zero as I send their mass to infinity. Okay? And then, uh, after I find the answer in particular gauge, I, is, I, uh, I write down the answer in arbitrary gauge, match it with what I learned from this particular gauge. And then I see that uh, this low energy action contains this term. And there is a small uh, additional argument, but we don't really have time for this, uh, which shows that this is in fact exact answer, that you can, uh, um, if you define this uh, metric like that, then uh, you will have um, um, you will have exactly exact answer. It's, again, it's a pure symmetry argument. It's, it has symmetries of this action, which uh, tells you that if this expression is true for small phi, it's true also for arbitrary phi. Uh, if someone is interested, I can uh, explain it after class. After the class. <clears throat> um, Actually, that was a digression from our main, uh, main line. And the main line was to see 
what happens to fermions when you couple them to gravitational field. And then we will compare it with a direct combinatorial construction of gravity, which we can make and uh, sum. It basically what we are discussing here is uh, two-dimensional fermions are two-dimensional Ising model. Coupling it to gravity means that you put it on some random fluctuating lattice. And that we will see a mm, little later. But at the moment I want to, to know what happens to fermion propagator. And the propagator, psi psi, mm, uh, is given by, say, psi minus psi minus, is given by this diagram. That's the correction to the propagator. And uh, now we have P, P minus K, K, P. We have to calculate the self-energy part. And uh, the self-energy part, uh, the propagator is, the zero order propagator is one over P plus. Uh, and so the correction, the self-energy will be integral d to k. There will be the propagator here, which we've already found uh, where it was. Let me see. Yes, uh, there will be this propagator. So we put 1 over c. Well, we, we will put 1 over c in front. Um, we will have uh, k plus divided by k minus to the cube. Uh, we will have the propagator of this fermion, which is p plus minus k plus. And uh, we have to uh, uh, read the vertices from, the, the vert from this term. So what shall I put, what, how I de decode uh, this diagram? What, what should I put to this vertex and to this vertex? Huh? P minus, uh, uh, P plus. Uh, well, first of all, it's P minus because it's, it's the energy momentum tensor which says here. So we have psi minus, d minus, psi minus. Uh, so it should be p minus, but also important that, uh, uh, so I, I want to ask, what, what, what should we do? Is, should it be p minus or should it be p minus minus k minus? What is it? Or something else? When we have this thing. Notice that uh, just as well we can write it uh, in this in this way. So it, be like an, an it will be since d minus acts on on the both uh, on on the both sides, uh, you can actually write down uh, p minus the two p minus minus k minus the sum of these guys. And it should be here, it should be here, uh, and it should be square of this thing. So well, that's our answer, which is which from this diagram. And now let's analyze it, let's evaluate it. Um, first of all, if I did make mistakes, well, which is questionable, but uh, how it diverges naively at very large uh, k. Yeah, it's linear divergence, so that should be it. Now, however, uh, why this linear divergence has zero chance to appear there? There will be no linear divergence, in fact. It will cancel for a simple symmetry reason. How you would, uh, for that, uh, that, that's a good way to deal with such integrals. 
you just have to look at its, at its spin. What is the spin of this expression? Spin is amount of pluses and minuses. So if, and linear divergence, the, the, let me explain the point. Linear divergence uh, is, uh, should be multiplied, it, it, it has zero spin. If we get, if our expression sigma has non-zero spin, there could be no, no divergence. So what is the spin of sigma? How, it's, uh, how it spins? Yeah, well, let's see. Uh, let me check it. Uh, so we have 1 over k minus square, 1 over k plus. Um, uh, oh, no. Uh, wrong. Uh, so we have, uh, let's, uh, we, let's write it down in terms of p plus. k plus divided by k minus to the cube. 1 or k plus and k minus square. <coughs> so what we, what we got? 1 or k minus, or k minus very good. Um, which is the same, the same spin as p plus. So which means after these uh, small evaluations, we conclude that sigma uh, should be proportional to p plus uh, multiplied. Uh, so therefore, the, this inter this integral cannot be uh, a linear divergence cannot be there. What I'm talking about is it's in the same sense as if you have a Euclid usual Euclidean integral, say d c x, and you have you can have x. Uh, in any power, and you put x mu here, uh, this integral is obviously zero. And that's the way this uh, linear divergence cancels. So we have the p plus uh, correction to sigma, and uh, the remaining integral is dimensionless. So, uh, which means that sigma uh, is proportional to p plus. I'm writing only meaningful uh, terms here. There is, of course, you can calculate the, all those pi's, etc. Um, I don't want to do it uh, now. It's one over c p plus logarithm of lambda square divided by p square. Uh, so that's the correction to the, and that should be added to the green function. Uh, so in this approximation, the green function is 1 over p plus, uh, 1 plus 1 over c logarithm lambda square by p divided by p square plus etc. Uh, so, uh, we, we, we get logarithmic corrections. That's not really surprising. It's two we know that in four-dimensional gravity, uh, quantum corrections are uh, quadratically divergent. Uh, because why they are quadratically divergent, by the way, in the... In, in, in the standard in the standard Einstein gravity, what's the origin of all these power-like divergences? Why uh, quantum electric? Huh? It's what? It's not no, what? Minimalist. Yeah, but why? Why? Uh, I'm saying. I'm asking. Well, why in quantum electrodynamics uh, we have uh, only logarithmic divergences? What's a simple one, two words answer to this? Dimensionless, dimensionless coupling, exactly. Um, if it is dimensionful, like uh, in Einstein gravity, it's, it has dimension of inverse mass square, 
all terms will will be coming with uh, there will be quadratic divergence but the, in gravity as you go to two dimensions you get dimensionless coupling actually the the newton the analog of the newton constant is this central charge c which is dimensionless and so we do we should expect logarithmic corrections and now we have to ask the question what will happen if uh, we sum up all those terms uh, and slightly miraculously it is possible to do and uh, the answer is that basically this term exponentiate this approximation in which we worked it's it, it's uh, working only when c is much greater than one uh, but uh, turns out that the the model is solvable for any um, for any C, mm, I will probably give you later the idea why it is so. I will not go into the details. But the answer is that um, you have uh, anomalous that if you have original CFT, yeah, for example, with a minimal model, so that without gravity, I'll put a zero here. Uh, we have a highly non-additive spectrum of anomalous dimensions. Uh, now, uh, these dimensions with gravity are dressed and the general formula is that uh, it, it 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 follows from some from some hidden symmetry of the theory, and I, I don't have time right now to explain it. But uh, there is the equation which determines the dressing, the gravity. What 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 happens is that there is a gravitational dressing. The k is some function, k plus 2 actually is p prime divided by p. Um, uh, the gravitational dressing means that uh, original scaling are renormalized, anomalous dimension are drastically changed as you go to gravity, and you can actually substitute after some small algebra, you can see what happens uh, to these anomalous dimensions. And what happens is quite remarkable because uh, dimensions become additive. Mm. While here it's like that, it's something like uh, because of that um, the operator pro so, so it's somewhat puzzling, but uh, because of that, uh, you see that dimensions, anomalous dimensions, become additive, and you can actually there is no singularities in the operator product expansion. Remember that uh, when we looked at the operator product expansion in general, uh, it it was x to the power delta L minus delta N minus delta M multiplied by OL. And this is, uh, this singularity, it's delta L, generally speaking, is not equal to delta N plus delta M, which is kind of an analog of bi dick energy uh, for this anomalous dimension. Turns out that uh, in quantum gravity, Mm, uh, there is no singularity here, and the algebra of operator product expansion becomes a finite algebra which you can analyze without any singularities. Um, I shall explain. It is assumed uh, that, well, the reason for this uh, is the, the reason for this simplification. Excuse me, let me start again. Uh, this additivity was used uh, actually in a very amusing way. Um, 
by people who were uh, working with po polymers on the surface. Conformal field theories, among other things, describe distribution of polymers on some surfaces. Uh, and uh, in order to find, uh, th and there were some operators, special operators, for which it was difficult to determine anomalous dimensions. Uh, and so people did something quite amusing and ingenious. Uh, they said, okay, let's add gravity to these polymers. Then uh, the dimension of their operators become trivial because of additivity. And they said, okay, let's make a composed operator, turn on gravity, make a composed operator uh, which has additive dimensions, and then apply, turn off gravity. So, in other words, the delta is some function of delta zero, and uh, they, uh, they, they, they delta plus in uh, their, their operator was delta one plus delta two, uh, and what they did was to uh, take the inverse function and say that it is delta zero, one, two. It is, uh, so uh, it's uh, quite, and uh, so they really got some numbers which can be in this way, which can be measured in the polymer physics. Uh, it's a little bit like one French recipe when you prepare, I think, uh, mm, uh, probably chicken by putting it between two pieces of me of uh, veal, and after it's prepared, you remove the veal. And, uh, you have some specially prepared chicken. Uh, uh, anyway, so it's quite amusing, and uh, it's not completely clarified. Uh, actually, this uh, the what why why this simplification takes place. Mm -hmm. It takes place because uh, that all descendant operators are removed by gravitational field uh, because we have gauge symmetry. And so the only operators, in this, I, I was telling you before that uh, the, uh, all those word identities, etc., they dictate the presence of secondary operators, of the descendants. And now all these descendants are killed by the gravitational field because uh, descendants is the change of the state when you make conformal deformation, holomorphic deformation of, of, your, of your base space. Uh, and, uh, but this, but the, when you add gravity, you have symmetry with respect to arbitrary diffeomorphisms. So this uh, variation of those deformation it doesn't make any. It, 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 it doesn't have any physical meaning. It's just a gauge artifact. Becomes a gauge artifact, and so you are dealing with a, a pure the uh, with primary operators alone. Now, uh, and that leads the algebras of these primary operators uh, form what is called topological uh, field theories. But it's not completely clarified in this way. That's why I'm not uh, going to uh, be more precise about it. It's still interestingly an open question, and it's uh, the last paper on that which, which showed some correspondence but didn't resolve the puzzle, I think, was uh, a month ago. I saw a month ago or something, or even maybe less. Um, so there's plenty of interesting stuff here. But uh, that's not what we, how we will proceed. Um, we will establish connection instead. Well, we will establish connection with a purely geometrical construction. What's, you see, in this type of things, it's very important to have, it's to have confirmation coming from different angles, so to say. Um, only then you can be sure you are not mistaken. It's very easy to make a mistake because uh, we don't have much experience with gravity. Um, and so it's quite a surprise 
I, I will just, since we are running out of time, I will just uh, formulate the statement and we will derive it later. It's quite a surprise uh, that you can uh, form a random lattice in the following way. Take collection of squares, so random geometry. It's com or combinatorial gravity. Uh, you have a basic object, a square. Uh, and you have many, many such squares. And you say uh, the rule, you formulate the rule, you, you say which, uh, which links are incident to, uh, to the other links. For example, if you have a cube, it's easy to say what the matrix of incidents is. And you want to sum, you put theory on this random lattice where those squares are arbitrarily connected, and then you um, sum over all possibilities. It seems extremely difficult to do, and, but in two dimensions, in high dimensions it is, but in two dimensions it's very easy. Uh, I will I give you the idea and uh, we will stop there. Uh, you introduce a dual lattice, uh, namely you put a spider inside, in, uh, inside each thing. And then gluing, gluing the random surface out of these squares uh, will give you what? Uh, just think what will happen if you now give, give the rule by which you glue together the, all those squares. What happens in terms of these dual objects, uh, dual spiders? Actually, what we'll have is just the Feynman diagram. That's what we'll get. Here we have a square, here we have another square, and this Feynman diagram tells you that you glue this and this. Um, and so the summation over random surfaces uh, will re be reduced to the summation over all Feynman diagrams. And that's, uh, uh, so as you see, it's a totally different approach. It has nothing to do with all these things. Nevertheless, the scaling exponents coincide precisely, will coincide precisely in this combinatorial and this thing. And the reason I'm uh, discussing this, well, we're uh, getting late. Um, the reason I'm discussing this is that I believe that uh, something similar uh, happens in higher dimensions, gauge theories, and so on. So it's a very interesting experience in two-dimensional thing, and it was quite a surprise. You see, people made uh, this random geometry and calculated fractal dimensions of this uh, and got some numbers, but it was totally unclear whether it's really equivalent to some metric tensor to the field theoretic formulation. And then field theoretic formulation was developed, the fractal exponents were found, and they turns out precisely the same as here. And that's what we'll see next time. Let's, let's stop now.